Well, good morning. I trust all of you have had an enjoyable holiday. With the opportunity to eat sumptuously and visit with your family and friends. One of the questions a lot of young people have and adults have in life is sort of which direction am I going to take? We face that question all the time. These young people are not quite facing it yet. Their folks are still pointing out most of the directions to them, although they've got to make up their minds about a few things, right? You're going to work hard in school. You're going to have fun. You're going to have good friends, right? Right, Nathan? Thank you. I appreciate that. And you're going to do what your mom and dad says. Good idea. What direction are we going to go in life? Some of these older people, like myself and so forth, have wondered how much longer we're going to live <laughs> and what we're going to do. You know, you uh, people have asked me several times, when are you going to retire? And I said, well, I don't know. I said, I don't really know what I'd do if I retired. <laughs> I don't. Well, actually, I do. I've been laying up projects for about 20 years for when I retire, whatever that is. But you think about that. What are you going to do? Some of these teenagers are trying to decide what they're going to, what kind they're going to do in life, where they're going to school, what they're going to study, what's going to happen. We want to know the directions we're going to take. And they're beginning. One or two of my grandchildren have discovered women. <laughs> and... You know, they smell nice, and uh, they talk nice to you. And your mother gives you enormous lectures over what to do around women. But anyway, so what? who, who am I going to date? I haven't gotten to the who am I going to marry stage, but how do I behave myself? What direction am I going to take? And a lot of you started out in life on some job, and you said, well, you know, well, I don't like this too much. Well, what are you going to do besides that? Uh, suddenly you've got kids, a wife, a husband. What are you going to do? So when making a decision, how does a person know that the choice they make is the one that God likes, one acceptable to him? You know, a lot of our choices in life really are, frankly, fairly cut and dried. It is obvious, or should be obvious, a lot of people don't make them very well some of them are more complicated I'd like to say everything's easy but a lot of decisions you've got to make in life are fairly complicated I made some wrong choices somebody says and I don't feel forgiven what about the choices that you make how are you going to judge those how are you going to make them well first of all it's obvious you need to make the choices God wants so the first question you need to ask as you think about these things is, does the Bible speak about this? In 2 Peter 1 and verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So the amount of grace that I experience, the amount of peace that I can recognize in life will be multiplied multiplied through the knowledge of God. How many of you started studying multiplication yet? Anybody? Are you all, all a little too young for multiplication? You have? Maybe a little bit? Nathan, have you started multiplication yet? A little bit. We talked about this the other day. You know, it's just a fast way to add. Remember? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate uh, my lectures are bearing some fruit in your memory. <laughs> multiplying in other words it just, just grows exponentially what grows exponentially grace and peace as a result of my knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord according as his divine power 
hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Read your Bible. The, Bi the Lord calls this here a gift. He has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. You know, if, if I were to tell you, you know, I can show you in one book, how many pages are in this thing? Let's see. That's Psalms. I guess you could read the Psalms, but it's about, uh, about 600 pages. 600 pages. That in that little 600 page book that I can put in my pocket is everything I need to know for life and godliness. I, you know, I, at my home, my wife keeps threatening me. I'm a book fiend. I've bought books and collected books. I've got friends who've given me books. And my, my book office is in the basement of the house. And it's good concrete floor. Otherwise, the place would collapse. Because it's a large room and it's lined with books. And I'm now just having to keep them in boxes on the floor. There's so many of them. But you know what? And, and I, my, one of my biggest problems is that I don't really use them much anymore because I've got a computer, which just did something funny on me. <laughs> I've got a computer. And so, so many of those books now are on the computer, and I can search them and research them and so forth. But if I could tell you, you really only need one book. Wouldn't that be great? Not that massive library. You just need one book. And so the Bible speaks on this. He's given me all things that pertain to life and godliness. You might notice 2 Timothy 3 as well. From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. What? What? that if you start studying when you're a child, you will know the basics, you'll know the Holy Scriptures that are able to make you wise. Anybody having trouble in school in some subject? What's your hardest subject? What's your hardest subject back there? Yeah. What? Roman culture. Okay, what in the world did you sign up for that for? <laughs> All those art appreciation classes you could have taken. <laughs> My goodness. From a child you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise. You don't have to know Roman culture. You really don't have to know... A lot of things that they teach you in school, you have to be wise unto salvation. Through faith is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, completely furnished unto all good works. In Matthew 4, Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted to the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. Yeah, I guess so. When the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Have you ever paid any attention to how he answered him? How did he know this? He answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it's written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time they thou dash thy foot against a stone. The devil quoted scripture to him. He said, The Bible says you can do this. 
But Jesus said, it's written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. He said, something accidental were to happen to me, that passage would come into play. But he didn't put that there for me to tempt him. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, showeth him all the kings of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. He was hungry. The devil tempted him with being hungry. A lot of you kids have never really been hungry. Someday you may. What are you going to do? Is that the worst thing that could happen to you? He tempted him with the idea of being famous. Maybe you're going to be jealous that you're not famous one day. You want those 15 minutes of fame that everybody's supposed to have. Jesus said, no, I'm not that. I'm not going to tempt God to save me. And then, do you know what Jesus had come here for? Jesus had come here for us, for you and me, to save us. And the devil said, I'll give you all of them, all the kingdoms of the earth and the glory of them, if you'll just fall down and worship me. And so somebody's going to come to you and suggest something awful to make you rich, to make you powerful, to make you popular. If you just give up something. Jesus knew the answer. Jesus saith unto him, Get thee behind me, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. In each instance, the Bible speaks. How do I guide my life? There's an answer. But you know, not everything is a clear question of right and wrong. Boy, that's hard. You know, a lot of you kids have just been going through the right and the wrongs. But a lot of things are not clear. They're not a clear right and wrong. And you're going to find that most of the decisions you have to make in life are not going to be clear questions. Does the Bible give you advice? Ooh. Now we're talking. Why did I have Mark always has grumbled at me the last couple of weeks? Because I make him read long passages. But boy, that passage in Proverbs 8 is beautiful. Read it again when you get a chance. Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth in the top of the high places, by the way in the places of the path. My wife and I were commenting, as we have many times in life. I think uh, uh, Sam, my grandson, Josh's boy, had a birthday just uh, today. Is it today? So he's turned 16. And uh, the two boys that were here Wednesday night, uh, Joe and Luke, have turned 16. They're headed down to get their driver. And their grandmother said to him, listen, when you get that, be careful with it. Be careful with it. Don't act a fool. Play attention. She said, because we have seen so many young people who have messed up their lives before they get to be 20 years old. Suddenly there you are at 18 and you decided to act a fool with a car. And you don't have a driver's license anymore. Did you know how hard it's going to be to do nearly anything without a driver's license in the good old U.S. of A. this days? Getting to a job, getting to college, getting to a class. Taking your girlfriend out on a date. You know, when you're 18, your mom driving you down to the movies is a little embarrassing. <laughs> Girls don't want to go with guys who are in that shape. Taking the bus is an option, but girls don't want to go with guys who have to take the bus. Think through it. And you know, not, it's not just in driving a car. It's in, you know, so many people, they decided to have sex too early. 
and they got themselves in a mess. They have children. They're trying to support in their teens. They're having to go out and get a job, and the job is taking child support out of them. And maybe they don't have the right to visit their child as often as they'd like. They've just messed up their lives. And I'm, that doesn't even talk about drugs, doesn't even talk about booze, and the thousand other mistakes you make. He's, it says she crieth at the gates, at the entering of the city. Wisdom, the ability to decide simple things. Like, do I need to show off in this car to show how fast I can go or to show how quick I can take a corner? Do I need to show off to some girl and prove to all the guys that I'm a real stud? Do I need to go along with everybody about the booze they're drinking or the drugs they're taking? <laughs> she says, Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. O ye simple, understand wisdom. And ye fools, be ye of understanding heart. Hear, for I will speak of excellent things. And the opening of my lips shall be right things. For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. When you get a chance, read Proverbs. Read Proverbs. Read Ecclesiastes. It's called the wisdom literature in the Old Testament. Sit down and read it. You might learn some things. In Proverbs 19, here I want you to notice, Mark probably wanted this verse. It's just one verse. It says, Hear counsel, receive instruction, that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. Now, who do you think would give you good advice? Well, it could be your mom and dad. They've sort of been through some of the troubles that you're going through and some of the rigors of life. Talk to them. Listen to them. Oh, you're young fireball ideas are all there but listen to them pay attention and you know the same thing goes as you get older you know here we are at 65 and 70 it might be good to get a little advice about what to do then you know what what do I do how do I how do I make what little money I've got stretch What's a good thing to do for my health? What, what would be enjoyable? Look, you might notice Proverbs 12 and verse 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth, hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. You know, everybody is just certain they've got their mind made up. We're all independent, we're free. But the best course in life a lot of times is to listen to somebody. Somebody you respect, somebody that maybe been through a few things, and let them give you some advice. Which direction to take? You might also notice James 1, verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, and that's nearly all of us, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. He that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You know, before you propose to that girl or before you accept that guy, you might talk to somebody about it. You might talk to your mom and dad. Actually, they know you better than anybody. They know you pretty well. You don't think they do, but they do. They've got your number. They know what you're like and who you can get along with. Maybe listen to some advice. They say, no, dear, you need to run from that guy as fast as you can. He's a bum. Has he got a job? Has he got any prospect of a job? And with many other words, they might testify and exhort. But listen to them. They know you real well. They'll give you good advice. 
listen to advice. There might be other folks in the church that you can talk to. Some of the saddest things that I've seen in life is I've had people come to me, adults, not children, and say, should I marry this man? And I've said, no, no, you don't have a right to marry him. And unfortunately, I found out, because I can search the Internet too, a few things about him. Run. Don't do it. You're going to mess up your life, mess up your kid's life. Won't happen right now. Won't happen at the first, but it's going to happen. I'm worried about it. Do you ever tell somebody they shouldn't get married when they want to get married? <laughs> nine times out of ten, they don't listen to you. And nine times out of ten, you were right. Because you're older and wiser, and you're not deeply in love with the guy. <laughs> you can sort of see a little better. Those rose-colored glasses aren't on you or your parents or others. Well... As you make these choices, sometimes in life, there's just no clear alternative. You know, I see some people, what am I going to study in college? What job am I going to take when I get out? Well, here's what the Bible advises you to do in those cases. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. There's no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. You get a job. Maybe it's not your ideal job. It's not your perfect job, and you're not the boss of the company. What does the Bible tell you to do? What's the advice it gives you? It says you do it hard. You do your best. You work hard. I returned and saw unto the sun that the race is not to the swift. What? You mean we, all, we don't all win? We don't get a participation trophy? No! The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Neither get bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. Time and chance happeneth to them all. So you do the best you can with what you have. For, a, for man also knoweth not his time. As the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. You need to realize that you have an opportunity to work now and to do things now you may not always have. Your health may fail. The, the economy may blow up. And suddenly you're going to be in a mess. Have you thought about that? Were you working when the time was to work? You might also notice as you think about this, Colossians 3 and verse 17. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Well, I hate working at McDonald's, you might say. I hate this job I've got. Whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do what you're doing in the name of the Lord Jesus. Not because it's a wonderful job, not because your boss is a prince of a man, not because the people you're working with are all kindly and gentle and your best friends, but you work because you're serving Jesus Christ. Do the best you can. You might also notice Acts 1, verse 24. When they pray, they prayed, they said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven. What happened to these folks? Well, they got in a situation where there wasn't any clear alternative. They had two men. They were both qualified. Which one are we going to choose? Well, what did they do? Well, maybe they voted. I think that's kind of sometimes giving lots. 
Maybe they just flipped a coin or some other sort of thing like that. But they asked, notice what they did? They prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, you show me. You show me which one, and I'm going to live by it. Since I can't make up my mind, you show me. Now, you may have some spots like that in life. I've had a couple where there wasn't any way to decide. And you prayed over it, and you did your best with the decision that was made. Think with me a little bit further. Sometimes good choices go bad. Whew. I'd like to tell you right now that every choice you're going to make in life is going to be a great one. Sometimes they're not. Do you realize Jesus, in John 6, verse 7, he chose 12 apostles and he says, have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Judas was a good choice, but he went bad. Some of your choices may go bad, too. You may choose friends, and those friends desert you. They go off in a direction you can't go going to have to say goodbye I hope your marriage is good I pray over it your parents pray over it but you know if you looked at the statistics these days some marriages go bad and folks prayed over them make your choice good make it well there's another one then Demas Notice, notice what the Bible says about Demas. In Colossians 4 and verse 14, it lists Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greets you, faithful companions of Paul and servants of Jesus Christ. In uh, uh, Philemon chapter 1 and verse 23, he, Paul says, Salute Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. But then you read in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 9. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, Timothy. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed into Thessalonica. Hmm. Have you had friends who were Christians who wandered back into the world boy that hurts here was a good choice and it went bad you're going to have to learn to live with that the Lord made a bad choice in Judas Paul's friend and his fellow laborer was Demas and he went wrong the prodigal son, he was raised by a good father, <clears throat> a loving father. There, the, he had one son <clears throat> that was faithful to him, but the other son went off. Made bad choices. You might notice Saul in the Old Testament. Saul was picked when he was shy. And a young man, the Lord warns him of that, tells him of that. And yet he went wrong. David was picked by, by uh, God, anointed by Samuel. But David committed fornication, adultery with Bathsheba. He made bad choices. Sometimes, certainly, good choices go bad. And you're going to have to learn how to deal with that and work with it. You may be forgiven, but you may have to live with the choices you made. <coughs> Did you know that? 
You can be forgiven. But the choices are still there. <coughs> you know, if you made those bad choices and got out there and acted a fool with your automobile, got picked up, lost your license, the Lord will forgive you for acting a fool, maybe for violating the law, but you're going to go without a license. And it may cost you money to get it back. Now, I could give you 15 examples of the same thing. You know, in school, there's always that opportunity to act fool. It'd be funny to maybe paint up the school or a wall. It'd be funny. Ha, 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 ha. And you hear your relatives all telling about the silly things they did when they were kids. And so you think, well, I can be an idiot too. But you know, when you get caught for using that paint and you get hauled off to court, you're going to have to live with that. And you know, your friends may be all out drinking. And you think, whoa, they're having a big time. And they're taking these drugs and they're having a wonderful time. And you know, it's really silly for the government to say those drugs are illegal. There you go. You get picked up. You're going to have to live with that. You may marry somebody that it turns out, lo and behold, that wasn't my best choice. But you don't have a scriptural right to divorce. You're going to have to live with that. You better think about it long and hard before you make that decision. In 1 John 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you're going to live with some of the consequences of those sins nevertheless. We try to ignore that in our society. And so we see young men and women go out and the young woman gets pregnant. They're not married. And she's young and paying for that child. All the expenses and the labor is hard. And so wouldn't it be easy just to get an abortion? We convince ourselves that that's right. And that'll make life easy for me. Well, one way or the other, you're going to live with that sin. You're going to live with the sin of adultery, either by struggling to raise that child, perhaps alone, or you're going to live with the sin of that abortion don't believe it's going to be easy to walk away from. You might also notice 1 John 2. My little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And in 1 Timothy 1, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorant and unbelief. But did you know as you look at the life of Paul, Paul was forgiven and he was so grateful for it. And God was using him and he was grateful for that. But can you imagine having killed people that not coming back to you in your nightmares having abused people separated parents from children and that not coming back to you you've been forgiven but there it is again you're so grateful that the Lord forgave you but you have to live with the consequences of that sin it's going to be there in Galatians 1 in verse 13, you've heard of my conversation in the time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly 
than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. You're going to have to live with some of those choices you make. And finally, you might remember 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. There hath no temptation taken you. No situation where you've got to make a decision. No situation where you seek out advice. Advice is good or bad. You make a good choice or a bad choice. There's no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. Other people have faced it. Other people have made good decisions and made bad decisions. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Now today, are you a Christian? Are you willing to listen to that advice? It says, Wisdom crieth from the highest hill, and he pleads with you simple to understand it. Believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your belief, come and be baptized. Fools, put it off. The wise man will obey and seek the Lord's advice so we can make good choices in life. Come while we stand and sing.